All right. Okay. We're talking today with Ron Oakes of Grand Rapids, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. All right. Now, Mr. Oakes, can you begin with a little bit of background on yourself uh, to start with where and when were you born? I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan on March 21st, 1949. Okay. And did you grow up in Grand Rapids? Pretty much Grand Rapids. Uh, graduated from Granville High School in 1966. Okay. And while you were growing up, what did your family do for a living? My father worked for Sears and Roebuck uh, down on uh, Pearl Street. Um, he worked for them for some 30 years before he finally retired. Mm -hmm. And how many kids were in the family? Five. Three girls, two boys. All right. Uh, and let's see, then you, what did you do after you finished high school? Uh, at that point, I went to junior college, Grand Rapids Junior College, for a year. And at that point in time with Vietnam going on and all my friends were pretty much going off to war, so to speak, being drafted or enlisting, I was pretty much the last one left. Um, so in June of 67, uh, I thought I was going down to Detroit for just a physical to, for enlistment. As it turned out, I raised my right hand and the next thing I know, we're on a plane going to San Diego for boot camp. It's like, I thought I was going back home tonight, you know, and I'm not. I'm, I'm headed west. Okay, but you basically had enlisted, though. I enlisted. I did not get drafted. Okay, and why did you enlist? I felt it was the right thing to do. I, I'm a volunteer person. I do a lot of volunteer work now. Mm -hmm. And when Vietnam was there, I wasn't going to wait for because I had a high draft number because of college. But since I, college wasn't working out and I couldn't keep my mind on my studies, um, in June, I decided it was time to go. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of rough at that time with my parents because my father was, at that time, he was like 38 or 39. Um, and when I turned 38, 39, and my son turned 18, I started to realize what my father was going through when I took off. So, mm -hmm. All right. Now, what did you know about Vietnam or the war in Vietnam at the time you enlisted? Um, at that point in time, I knew it was a, in Indochina. And we were fighting the communists, and they were trying to overtake Indochina. And we were trying to help a small country take care of themselves, like we did in Korea. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and at that point, did you see the war as being something that was likely to be pretty dangerous, or were you not really thinking about it because you were 18? Yeah. It, in the back of your mind, you know it's going to be dangerous, but at 18, you're footloose and fancy free it's like we're headed for combat with the rest of the people and you know let's get in some action let's let's get going mm -hmm. all right uh, so you go down to Detroit you enlist and you find yourself being sent off to training right away uh, where do you go for basic training basic training was in San Diego Marine Corps recruit depot in San Diego went through boot camp there and then we went up to Camp Pendleton which was just up the road uh, on the coast of California and went through our um, rest of our infantry training. All right. Uh, now, how did they get you out to California to begin with? We went out from um, on a commercial airline from Detroit to Chicago and it, it was kind of funny because at that point in time the plane was late getting into Chicago but they held the aircraft for like 12 of us that were going out to San Diego. So people were I think the people on the plane were understandable because they weren't getting upset, but we went on a commercial airline. Uh, Detroit gave us airline tickets and we were in a group. We had one person in charge. And, you know, they just picked, you are in charge. Make sure these people get on the airplane. And so we flew commercial to San Diego and then uh, recruit depot has a bus there to pick everybody up. They know who's coming. They check your names off from that point on. You belong to Uncle Sam, and you don't go anywhere without a checklist. All right. And then how do they treat you upon arrival? Um, at that point in time, it's a little different than it is now. Uh, a lot of screaming, a lot of hollering, hurry up, move. And, you know, you're in, the, you're in the Marine Corps now. You're not at home. You belong to me. And that was pretty much it for the next eight weeks of boot camp. All right. Uh, and then what physically did they have you do in boot camp? Well, in boot camp, we went through a lot of training, um, how to use a rifle, how to um, maneuver, um, a lot of physical training, PT, a lot of that. Um, of course, the marching drill, 
and then classes on um, such things as um, putting on battle dressings, uh, uh, sanitation, hygiene, they were big on that, safety, uh, those type of things. All right. Now, what sort of people were serving as your instructors at that point? Those were Vietnam veterans that had already had a tour or two of Vietnam and came back and went to a DI school, drill instructor, got the smoky bear hat, and they are now drill instructors. All right. Uh, and one of the sort of the stereotypes about Marine training in, in particular is that the drill sergeants are particularly ab abusive or harsh or At that or time, they could be abusive and harsh depending on what your attitude was. I grew up saying yes sir, no sir to anybody older than I was. And in Marine Corps, it's yes sergeant, no sergeant, or yes sir, no sir to the officers, and that's the only thing you say. I didn't have any problem with, with uh, authority when I went through boot camp. Some of the people that were with me just couldn't get the grasp of the yes sir and no sir, and they paid the price for it. Okay. Now, at this point, I would expect they maybe don't actually wash a whole lot of people out, but they just, no. they just find ways to make their lives more difficult. If you were overweight, they put you in a separate platoon to lose weight. Mm -hmm. We had one instance where we were training. I, I don't remember if it was marching or getting ready for a long march or whatever, and what they called the fat platoon came by, and they had one straggler. Well, he collapsed, and they put him up against a tree, whatever shade they could find. Now, this is, you're looking at June, July, August of, of 1967. It's hot in Southern California, really hot. Well, this guy here was obviously heat stroke or whatever, and they put him up the tree, but they didn't call him medical attention. They went on their four-mile march and came back. By the time they come back, he was dead is what we understand. We were left and we come back and all we saw was some people carrying a body away. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably the worst scenario for boot camp. We also had some, in boot camp, we learned how to use a poke, the um, oh, hand-to-hand -hand combat using pogo sticks and whatnot. Um, they would start out with two people and then as one would get knocked down, then they'd bring another one in. Eventually the guy that's knocking everybody down is gonna get tired and he's gonna get knocked out. So it was like the last person in the line. They really had the chance to be the number one. All right. You're referring to, to pogo sticks. And I'm assuming you're not talking about things you bounce up and down on. With a no, spring. a pogo stick is a long stick with a um, uh, padded end on each mm -hmm. end that you hold. If you've ever seen the movie um, Robin Hood where they're on top of the log and they're fighting, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just you're jostling back and forth. You're fighting with the staff, but in this case, with a big thing on the end, the Robin Hood. Basically, it was training on how to use a rifle with a bayonet. Mm -hmm. And that was other training we had, bayonet training. All right. Uh, now, when you're getting this initial combat training and you're being trained by people who, who'd been in Vietnam, are they telling you anything about what actually happens there or things specific to Vietnam, or was it all still at a more no, basic level? No, it was level? basic level because we got that, the... Um, the input from the, the next set of instructors from Infantry Training Regiment up in um, Camp Pendleton, where you got more and more um, heavier training. Mm -hmm. You did your rifle qualifying up there. Um, they had, when I came back from leave, they had what they called staging battalion, where they actually put you through a, what they did is they built up a, a village mock-up of, in Vietnam, and they showed you how the booby traps were developed what to look for, what not to do, um, things like that. Like, you never go through a, um, a hole in a tree line that a tank went through because it's going to be booby trap. They teach you that what you normally would do as an American, the American way of doing things, you change. You don't do it that way over there because the enemy has taken those, those ideas and use them against you. If there's an opening, that's where you're going to go because it's the easiest way. You're not going to take a machete and hack a new path. So that opening is going to be booby-trapped in one way or another. And 99% of the time, it was. If you wanted to get through a tree line safe, you cut your new path. And you cut it away from that one because they knew that, you know, the opening's there. Well, he's just going to step over two or three steps cut another one. No, you go over here 10 feet, 20 feet away and do another one. All right. Uh, so the sequence here, how long was the boot camp stage? Boot camp was eight weeks, and then it was about eight weeks in uh, infantry training. 
So after about 16 weeks, we're allowed to go home on leave. And I went home on leave on October 1st okay. or 8th, something like that. Now, when you go home, are you going home in uniform or civilian clothes? Or um, At that point in time, you go home in your, your class A uniform. You mm -hmm. traveled in uniform then to go home. Um, we had not been in Vietnam yet in the anti sentiment wasn't really that strong in 66 and mm -hmm. 67 mm -hmm. or 67 yeah yeah I mean the the watershed for a lot of that is Ted in 68 when you that's really when it really it. started going bad with 68 69 that's when we were advised differently traveling right okay now what was it like to go home after 16 weeks in, in Marine Corps training well being the first time I'd ever been away from home it was I was glad to get back um, Obviously, went around and visited family um, and slept in, ate a lot, good food. Not that the military doesn't serve. At that point in time, the, the food wasn't bad in the mess halls. It was good food, and you could eat as much as you want, but you ate all you took, and that was a golden rule. While I was in boot camp in San Diego, I was what they called a smedley. Smedley is the one that serves the officers and the DIs. So I, got, I didn't have to wash dishes and didn't have to do any of that. I just made sure they got, you know, hand like in a restaurant. That was my job there. So I avoided the really dirty jobs at the mess hall. But getting back to coming home, um, just went around and see friends. Um, everything was pretty good. Uh, I had a good time. Uh, I knew where I was going when I went back because I was, my orders already told me I was going back to Camp Pendleton to staging battalion, and that's where they teach you. In boot camp, we went through with the M1 rifle. We qualified with the M14 rifle. In stage of battalion, they give you an M16 rifle and show you how to use it, how to clean it. So at that point in time, we knew what was going to happen. But my last Saturday at home before I went back, a buddy of mine who I'd been in uh, junior college with before I enlisted, asked me for a blind date, asked me if I'd take out a blind date. He had somebody that needed a date and it fell through and he needed somebody quick. And since I was leaving, how would you like to go on a blind date the day before you take off to go back to go overseas? So I took a blind date and it was a canoe trip in Pine River. And her name was Kathy. And we got along good. And uh, took her home that night. Next morning at seven o'clock, I'm on an airplane for Chicago, I think. And then from there, it was back to California. And uh, so she was a blind date. The bottom line is, at the end of the story, I ended up marrying her when I came back. But uh, we'll get to that later. All right. OK, so now you get back. You back, back to Pendleton again. Um, and so you're with the, with the staging battalion at that point. Now, how long is that phase? Normally, staging battalions, um, I think it's like two or three weeks. But we had only been there about a week, and uh, they came out a list of people um, one morning that for, because every morning you'd fall out for formation, for roll call to make sure everybody's there. And this one morning they called and said, these following Marines step out over here. So they read like six or eight names, and I was one of them, and we went over there. And they dismissed everybody else and told them to get on the trucks, you're going to training. Well, they told us to get our gear together, you're going back to home base, uh, to main base. We were out on a sub base, Camp Onifree, out in the middle of nowhere. And he told us, your name's been pulled, you're going to language school. You're going to become interpreters. And we just kind of looked at each other like, oh, OK. Gets us out of training. You know, by that time, we, were, we felt like we were old hands. You know, mm -hmm. went, OK, it's easy duty. We'll go. So went back. We spent two, almost three weeks waiting for them to get enough people in. They needed 150. And it took them a couple weeks to get 150 people with their test scores that put them in that category. And then they bust us up to Monterey, California. It was like, I want to say six buses, something like that. And that's just the Marines. So I, I don't remember the day they took us off, but it, uh, we ended up getting up there. We were up there in time for Thanksgiving. So sometime in November mm -hmm. that we went up there, probably mid-November, and uh, took a bus trip up there. And on the way on the bus trip, it was interesting because we had some Motorcycle characters, there must have been three or four of them, come up behind us, you know, doing whatever speed, faster than the buses. And they go to pass the bus, and they see all these military people on the bus. So they start their gestures and this and that and raising their fists and all that kind of stuff. 
And they were really, and then they started playing with the bus drivers, cutting in front of them and this and that, making them hit the brakes and whatnot. Well, then they made the mistake, got in front of the front bus. And at that point in time, they started to slow down, then they speed up, slow down. Well, they slowed down one too many times, and the bus driver just floored it. And when he did, the last thing we saw were these three motorcycles going off into the sands alongside the road, and the guys flying off the end of them. And the bus driver just blowing his horn and just keep right on going. It's like, you don't mess with me. And, of course, that was just cheers and all the buses you could just you must have heard that for miles as everybody was just yelling at the bus driver telling him he was doing a good job but that was our trip to to uh, monterey all right now uh how did language school go i'm not really great on language so it was and at that point in time you had these big cassette recorders with uh, eight inch tapes that you listen to and you start in the beginning and they teach you on a, our instructors were young uh, 18 year old vietnamese girls and they trained in their traditional garb. Um, they could speak English pretty good, broken a little bit at that point in time, very fluent in Vietnamese. Um, we went through the 12 weeks, um, had a good time in school. Everybody graduates, period. I mean, at this point in time in the war, everybody passes. And they, they would tell you that the more you used it in country with the dialect and everything, the better you're going to get. You just need to use it, and you're going to get better at it, yada, yada, yada. And they're right in that respect. Um, why we were at the school, um, we got adopted by a Chinese family out of Salinas, California, Mr. and Mrs. Young. There was four of us they took you know, for, things, for Thanksgiving. And we got together, got really close to them. Their son was a corporal at Contien, I believe, or Camp Cura, one of the others up there. So he was already over there. He was a corporal. So they, they were, there were a lot of families around there were adopting military people for the holidays, mm -hmm. and they, they took care of us. We developed a good relationship, and we did, for, I went to visit him after I got back. But anyway, one weekend he took us up to San Francisco. We went to a really fancy restaurant in our Class A's, and we played the dignitary role we were their guards so the two of them are dressed up they're between us and there's four guys two in the back two in the front walking them around oh we had a ball <laughs> doing that it was the looks we got and of course mrs young she'd kind of get kind of red you know but we had a good time and that that was our time in school um and that lasted until like february 28th of 60 february 28th 67 no, February 28th of 68, because yeah. March, we flew out. No, it wasn't. It was earlier than that because we flew from Traverse Air Force Base, north of, Cal north of San Francisco, to Okinawa. We had like four or five days there. So I don't know the exact time we left mm -hmm. California, I don't remember. But we were there four or five days getting our shots and whatnot. Now, the only gear we're carrying with us is the clothes that we have and the gear that you're normally issued uniform-wise. You're not issued any combat gear, rifles, or anything. So in Okinawa, it was pretty much going through the paperwork of getting your shots and whatnot. And you got to remember, at this point in, in time, there are no computers. It's all typewriters. So there's a million people in there typing things. Orders are all typed up. And of course, then they don't, nowadays, you'll get your individual order with one person's name on it most of the time. Over there, you might have 200 people in the same order because they're just going to do it once and then they're going to put on a mimeograph and make you copies. And you always carry 10 or a million copies of your orders with you because you never know when you've got to give somebody one for something. So Okinawa was basically shots and paperwork. And then uh, one day they took us out to Kadena Air Force Base and put us on a Continental Airlines jet. They were the contractor at that time, Continental Airlines. And they flew us into Da Nang. It was a very short flight. You want to just pause here for a moment? I'll just cut that out. 
that, at least my, the, the interruption out at, anyway, but I didn't want that going off again. Okay, thanks. All right, we were talking about uh, you're at you're on Okinawa, you're on your way to Vietnam. Uh, you hadn't been issued. You don't have combat gear or equipment and things like that. No. Uh, and now there, now was there a standard set of new equipment that you get, or could you pick up used stuff? Or well, we land in Da Nang on the Continental Airlines, and as soon as they open that door for the aircraft, now. There's no jetway, it's the ladder truck. And uh, being that it's in a combat environment, they hurry up and get you out of there because Da Nang Airfield's always getting hit with mortars or rockets, rockets particularly, even daytime. Anyway, they, we get down and we go into these transit barracks. They're just two-story wooden barracks that, I don't know, they're probably as long as this building. And uh, of course, they're not air-conditioned, they just got screen windows on them. So you spend a, a day or so there while they decide where you're going to go as a replacement. Okinawa is just a processing. You don't really know or they don't know where they're going to put you until you get on the ground. And getting on the ground in Da Nang is going to the transit barracks. And then every morning you again, every morning in Vietnam, you have a formation in the rear area and a head count to keep track of people. So the next one morning, you know, we hadn't been there maybe two days at the most formation and start calling names off. Well, this happened to be my day. They call me and a bunch of other people and they said, get on that truck, get your gear and get, be in formation over here in 30 minutes, whatever. So we get on a truck and they start heading south on Route 1 and it couldn't have been 20 minutes or so and we were where we're going to be. We were at Camp Dong Song 2, which was a Vietnamese village that was no longer there, but it was now a military camp with uh, uh, along Highway 1, just south of a bridge, south of Da Nang. This compound was the rear area for the 27th Marine Regiment. And the 1st Battalion also had their headquarters there with the uh, Alpha, Bravo, Del Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta companies were all stationed there. So once they dump us off, then they, you go to this company, you go to that company, and so forth and so on. And I think there was only like six or eight of us. And they divided us up between the four companies. Um, some of the guys were the same guys that came out of language school with. I think two of them were. Mm -hmm. So there were three of us from the same class got there. And uh, the base was um, all rudimentary. Uh, it had a mess hall. All the buildings where you've seen pictures of where they take a two by four frame and take canvas and put over it. And some of them were a two by four building basic with screen windows and wooden flaps that would come down at night and the corrugated roofs. Um, those were your office offices and mess halls, the barber shop, the med center, and, and that kind of thing. Living quarters were just GP medium tents on the other side of the road, just behind a perimeter. You got all the foxholes and well, they're not really foxholes, but your bunkers, your your perimeter bunkers, and the Constantine wire and claymores and that in front, and then probably 50 meters back is where you got your living quarters. Um, but there's also a berm there, which makes it a little harder for the enemy to shoot you in your tent because they can't see you through the dirt. All right. um, now, did you have as well foxholes or trenches or something to hide in if you got? If more? we had incoming, we had uh, incoming bunkers that we could jump into, with, which gave us overhead cover. They were made out of sandbags. Some of them had reinforced corrugated metal. Some of them uh, uh, railroad ties, if you want to call it that. They were they were constructed very well. All right. Now, which specific unit were you assigned to? When I got there, I was assigned to Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 27th Marines, 3rd uh, Platoon. Okay. And you were just there at, at that point as a regular rifleman? or As a regular rifleman um, that knew Vietnamese. But at that point in time, it comes to being, they were shorter radio operators. So the very next morning in formation, because of the history of the 27th, they just got there themselves just a couple weeks before. They were shorthanded, and that's why a lot of replacements kept coming into them. They were on a float out of, Oka, out of uh, Hawaii, and the president diverted them to Da Nang, where they were under strength to begin with, so now they're building back up. They don't have the critical MOS jobs, the radio operators and squad leaders and machine gunners and this and that. So as people are coming in, they're filling in these positions to try to get up the strength. Let it be known that we never got the full strength. We were always probably around half at the most. 
But anyway, that next morning, the platoon commander, or the platoon uh, lieutenant comes out with a platoon tires sergeant, and I says, "How many people here do not know how to operate a radio?" Well, there was like four of us that raised our hands, and that was a mistake. I learned that the, after that, I never raised my hand. You are now radio operators. Now we I'd never even seen one before, but now we're radio operators, so they're putting us through OJT training. Um, report to Corporal so and so, and he's going to show you how to use the radio. So we had a little class, and he showed us what it was, how to operate it, and what to do, and what a radio report was, and all this and that. And in about an hour, the next day we're out on patrol. It's like, you know, I've got eight guys, nine guys out here, and I'm the only one with communication. And you guys are in deep doo doo because I don't know how to operate this thing. So it was a quick OJT lesson. Um, it only took me a couple of days, and I knew how to use it because our lives depended on it. So every chance I got, every question I had, I asked somebody. So I was a squad radio operator for, I don't know, maybe two, three weeks. Patrol, two patrols a day, one in the morning, one at night. So we were out during the day, and we were out at night. Now, what were those early patrols like? What would you do? What, if anything, happened while you were out there? Well... Patrolling around there, we were in the what they call the rocket belt. This is the area where the Viet Cong and the NVA would shoot 122 millimeter rockets at Da Nang. So they would, and all they needed was a, a mound of dirt and lay it there, ignite it, and just shoot it. They didn't aim it; they just aimed it toward the airfield, hoping they'd hit something. It was more H and I harassment inter, uh, and interdiction of firing to keep everybody awake. Our job was to patrol. At night, we would go out. And just before dark, we'd probably stop in a little area, set up a perimeter, have people in, in around, and we'd, everybody would eat on shifts, eat their sea rations. And then after dark, we would move from that position because they saw us dig in there. They're always watching us. Whether we can see them or not, you're always under the eye, and we knew that. And you had to, you had to remember that no matter what you did in the, in the Da Nang area because of the civil, civilian population, you were always being watched. So right after dark, we'd move maybe 100 meters and we'd set up an ambush site. Because if they knew where we were in daylight, they're coming after dark. We're hoping they're coming down this trail. And instead of them ambushing us, we, we'll ambush them. And we sent out many ambushes, did this many nights. Some nights we didn't. Some nights we just, we'd leave it right after dark and it'd be two, three hour patrol in the dark. You always had your checkpoints and you checked in with the company. Um, radio operator because he had a map and he knew right where you're going on the overlay and he in his log he'd say okay they're at checkpoint one and they knew exactly on the um, map where that was and we do that day and night mainly to just keep our presence there and keep the enemy off guard mm -hmm. uh, during the day at night you're, you're going down pretty much set paths but you always you never went down the same trail or the same route two nights in a row or ever you always deviated. And on a map, a map is in 1,000 meter increments. What they tried to do is have a patrol in every one of those quadrants every day. So you may be over on one side of the base patrolling tonight. Tomorrow you're at a different one. Right. Now, did you ever actually encounter anything while you were out there? Occasionally we would have movement. Um, the point man would alert everybody and everybody hit the ground. Um, around the first couple of weeks there, um, I don't recall much in the way of contact. The units had contact, but the patrols I was with, I don't remember any early contact with them, but the company did. Um, it was not unusual every night to have something going on. But I was lucky, and the patrols that I was with, it's a squad, re squad radio operator, didn't hit much. Okay. So how long then did you stay with this kind of routine? Or I was with the squad for, like I said, a couple of weeks, and then I got promoted to platoon radio operator. Mm -hmm. Platoon radio operator, trip to booby trap, and they medevaced him out. And I seemed to be the next one in line, or at least for whatever reason they had, they promoted me up. So I became the platoon radio operator. So when we had a platoon um, operation where we took all three squads with us, then I would go, with, wherever the lieutenant went, Wherever Lieutenant O'Rourke went, I went. Whether it was just going out to inspect 
uh, patrol, patrol base or the lines or whatever. I was with him always. I was his communication. Okay. And then how long did you stay with him? I stayed with him until he tripped a booby trap on Ganoy Island. And how long was that after you started up with him? Um, we were together for, I became the platoon radio operator probably, I want to say the end of March. We went to, in the first part of April, we went to uh, Way. They moved us up there to take over some uh, territory. I think it was from the 3rd Marines for a while. This, they were still doing a lot of cleanup from, from the Battle of Way during mm -hmm. Tet Offensive. A lot of North Vietnamese troops in that area yet. And a lot of them didn't care about getting in, in firefights with the Marines. It's like, come at us. We're ready for you. They had, over the years, built a lot of heavy bunkers and a lot of fortifications in these villages that you can't see from the air because vegetation grows really fast. So they build something, and they do it in stages. Um, so we were down in Da Nang for a couple of weeks, and then near the first part of April, first week of April, we were moved by truck con, I think it was by truck convoy, to uh, the way area. We were south of the way, I think 6,000 meters. Again, we were on Highway 1. Our platoon was assigned a, the detail of protecting this bridge and part of the oil line that went from Fubai to Wei. And at the same time, our main patrol base was across the road about 500 meters. There was two mound, uh, one big mound of dirt. I mean, you look, and, and the rice paddies are flat as can be, and for some reason or other, Mother Nature decided to be funny, and right in the middle of them, she put a mound of dirt almost 100 meters tall. So from that mound, you could see a long way, and everybody knew you were there. So that's where we're at in Way, and that was first week of April. Well, the whole company's up there. Around April the 13th, um, there was, we, while we were up there, we did a lot of what they call no-name operations. They were just the anvil and a hammer, where you would have a couple of uh, companies in line. They would push, and you have another company down there as a blocking force that would just, like, push them in the net. So a lot of that's done. Every, every week there's something like that going on somewhere. Um, that was the classic tactic that we used. Well, one of these operations, the second week of April, around the 13th, our company was, my platoon was detached. We were left behind to take care of the company area, so we were kind of divided up. And the other two platoons went with the Cop Bravo Company and Charlie Company to sweep through this village. Well, to make it short, they swept through the village and got ambushed. And I'm on radio watch in the, in the, at the bridge at this time in a sandbag bunker. And uh, I'm on the circuit, and I can hear them because we always stay in the same circuit the same, together to communicate. And they really got nailed. Um, we lost, well, it was 42 wounded and 15, uh, I had to figure 26 killed and 46 wounded on that operation alone. Basically, I, had, I was in more combat in the first seven months with the 27th Marine Regiment than I was in the last half of my tour with the 4th Marines. Mm -hmm. We, that operation, we could hear them on the radio screaming and hollering. People were getting hit all the time. And we could hear the gunfire and, and whatnot vaguely because they were quite a ways away from us. But it's flat. Things echo. You're always hearing explosions. In Vietnam, you're hearing explosions all the time. It's just like horns beeping almost here in the States because it, there's always something going on. But anyway, on the radio, I could hear him. We could hear him yelling names of people. You know, Lieutenant Kettner, where's he at? He's hit. Or Latterboy, where's he at? They got him. And the people were moving around and trying to help each other. But Reinforcements arrived. They got them back, and they pulled them back that night. And uh, our company was just totally decimated. Um, we left three or four bodies on the, on the battlefield. We couldn't get to them that, as dark was coming. Mm -hmm. Next morning, they went and retrieved the bodies. They had been stripped, mutilated. Uh, the Viet Cong had uh, mutilated them and took all their equipment. But we recovered the bodies. 
And then in the ensuing days after that battle, they took part of our platoon, probably a third of it, and put it in the other companies. And they pulled our company out of that area and put us back in the uh, safer area uh, to regroup. And then they transferred people from other companies into ours to beef it back up because, you know, we were only about 110, 115 strength, something like that. No, we were half the strength we should have been. Mm -hmm. And after this battle, we were even worse. But that was the worst time there. Um, being in the hooch, hearing the battle going on, and you can't do anything. We can't help our friends. Um, it was a hard time at that point in time. Now, while you were with the 27th Marines, did you yourself get into uh, any kind of dangerous spots or, or, or situations? Uh, there was a few. Um, I had my radio antenna shot off twice when I was with the 27th um, on patrols, ambushes. Um, there was one instance, and I don't know the exact time it happened. Um, it was the first time I really got scared. We were on a patrol, and it was raining. And we started taking night sniper fire, and it was only eight of us. And uh, we hit the ground behind some logs. And when I went to use the radio, I couldn't. They had a captured radio on the same frequency, and they were sitting there going like this on a microphone. When I heard that, I knew that we'd been compromised. Mm -hmm. Well. I went to go to the secondary, and the same thing. So the, the NVA were jamming our radio signals. So the eight of us were in a circle, and it's raining, and we're taking sniper fire. And uh, we must have sat there for two hours. And uh, evidently, they didn't know what our true strength was because they didn't rush us. And after about two hours, the sniper fire stopped, and we retraced our, mark, our uh, footsteps and got the heck out of there. Um, I think that was the first time I was a little leery about uh, how long I'm going to be there. Um, there were other times. Um, I stepped on a booby trap 105 round that did not go off. I was very fortunate because it would have taken out four of us. The, we were on a patrol over in the 327 area. Um, after Gorno Island, we went back and they took us into the, in the, the desert sandy area near the coast. And we were on a patrol. And you know, you're keeping, oh, 15, 20 feet apart, you know, you never get close to anybody. I always stayed behind the lieutenant, either to his right or to his left, wherever he told me to be, so that I could get the radio to him as fast as we need. So if we got hit and bullets started flying, my job was to run up and get down next to him so he could communicate. And uh, he had walked, we must have been just side by side. He must have just stepped on the edge and missed it. And I was on the other side. We did walk the path. We didn't, you don't walk paths or anything that somebody's been at because, again, the Viet Cong knew, you know, here's a path. They're going to walk the path. That's where the punchy stick's going to be, the trip wires, and so forth and so on. So he was like on one side and I was on the other. Well, my side was where the hole was. I stepped on it, and it was made out of sea ration carton. The sleeve to a sea ration was on its side, down, and the, the 105 round, which stands about that long, and it still had the, the cone on the end. And what they did is they had board, a board underneath with a nail in it. So if I'd have hit that cone and pushed down, that would have detonated it down there from what I could see in the sand. But what happened is I stepped on the top of it on the edge. And when I did, my boot went down like this, and it went this way. And as soon as I felt myself going down into a hole, I instinctively fell to my left on my side because I had the radio on my back. and. It, I wasn't going to try to fall on my back. I wanted to fall on my side and use the radio for protection. So I fell. And as soon as I fell, I started crawling away as fast as I could to get away from this in case it was delayed or something. And uh, I made a noise. And the lieutenant turned around. And he saw me crawling away from this hole. He instinctively dived. And the next thing you know, everybody's diving for the ground. And he, he calls to me. He says, Oaks, what happened? I stepped on a hole, sir. So he crawls back. And we both kind of look over and, oops, that's not something we want to be close to, if, especially if there's a gook over in a tree line there with a detonator and he's just going to click it and we're all gone. Because that would be just what they do. I step on it, now everybody's going to gather around and look at this thing, and once he's got four or five guys around, he detonates it and he takes out five or six. Well, as it turned out, nobody was around. I, took a, I carried an Instamatic 105 or 104 camera with me. I went through like four of them in Vietnam, but that's where all my pictures came from. And I took a couple of pictures of that. We had an engineer with us, or one of the guys that did engineer work. He had some C4 explosive with him. 
So he came, he crawled over to it, put C4 around the nose cone of it, put wire to it, and for some reason or other, about 50 meters away was a hole that a bulldozer had gouged out. Now, it's not unusual that when we have a firefight and we've got enemy KIA, we call in a, a helicopter, we'll bring in a, a mini bulldozer that's got maybe a, a six foot blade on it. He digs a trench, we throw all the bodies in there, and he buries it, and the helicopter comes back and takes the bulldozer away. Well, there was this trench, but it was nothing in it. And so we, we all walk up and we all get over in the trench. Now, meanwhile, we got perimeter, we got security around us. There's people in all four quadrants watching for activity. So the core of us, is like six of us, we go back to this trench and yell fire in a hole so everybody knows what's going to happen. And then one of, them, one of the guys says, wouldn't it be funny if they booby trapped this hole to go off when that goes? Because that was, again, you know, they know what Americans do. They're going to look for the easiest way. So there's the, where we're going to blow. Well, there's a ready-made hole right here, so let's go get in it. And as soon as that guy said that, we all looked at each other and said, and we got out of the hole, three on each side, got away from the hole, laid down on the ground, and the lieutenant told the engineer, blow it, and he blew it. Luckily, that hole didn't blow. But that would be something the Viet Cong would do. They know that, okay, if that doesn't trigger, then they're going to get, you know, we could be blowing that, and at the same time you blow that, it blows this. And that's just the way they thought. They, they think, they know what the American theology, uh, I don't know what you say, uh, the idea of thinking is. Mm -hmm. We always take the easiest way. Look at everything we do. We tried, most often, we always do it the easy way. Mm -hmm. And that's what got a lot of people killed and wounded in Vietnam. One, they weren't thinking, but they were doing, they were thinking stateside the easy way. And that's what cost lives. Mm -hmm. So we blew that. That was, that was one. And there was others. Um, had a B-40 rocket hit a wall about from here to that wall behind us during one of the units, one of our uh, Operation Allenbrook, we had a, the 81s were, and H&S Company were out in the middle of the rice paddy and had a perimeter with some Amtraks. They got hit that night. We were about 500 meters over in a little hamlet or what was left of one. It was, I think it was a grocery store because I found wrappers on the ground from different things. I picked up some of them for souvenirs. and. Uh, they were firing, and one of the gooks fired a B-40 at an Amtrak and went over the top of it. So we're sitting here watching the firefight. We can't do anything about it because it's too far away, and they're afraid that if we move, the people there may think we're gooks and start shooting at us. All of a sudden, we see this rocket come through the air, and it's just coming right, right toward us, and it hit the wall behind us. That was close. That very Within 24 hours, we had that, and then when the battle was over there in daylight, the gooks were moving south. We got an uh, intelligence report that one of the villages saw 50 of them moving south. So since we're not, we haven't been in a battle and we're not mauled, it was our job to sweep the battlefield and move south and try to catch these guys. So we're doing it, and probably 90 minutes after we started, we're, we're 2,000 meters south, two clicks south. In the air, we're in contact with an area observer. He's spotting and whatnot, and he tells us he sees the NVA moving. They're in the open. Okay. And he's he's calling in fixed wing. That's fine. Cut the sky hooks. Skyhawks. So we're watching and and we're right at this rice paddy dike and it, it can't be more than fourteen inches tall. And this is the dry season, so there's no wet rice paddies other than the canals. And I'm listening to him because I got the radio and I'm talking to him and he gives me the coordinates and I look at a map and I give the coordinates to the lieutenant and he says no, it can't be. That's our coordinates. Next thing we know, we look behind us. Here comes two A4s and around, and they're coming. And all of a sudden, you see these two snake eyes drop from beneath, and all you can see is two X's for the tail fins. They're hitting us. The lieutenant says, all of a sudden, we're yelling in the radio as we hit the ground. The lieutenant says, take cover. And all we can do is, you know, 11 of us get up against this rice paddy dike and get down. Luckily, the bombs hit. Oh, probably 150 meters into the woodland in front of us, and uh, we could hear the shrapnel going across over our heads. That was the first skyhook. Then the next one comes around, and we're thinking, we're cooked. At this time, I'm screaming in the radio to the area observer. We're popping all the smoke grenades we got. It looked like, you know, a flower box there with purples, black, uh, reds, oranges, whites, even a Willie Peter. And coming around, and uh, 
the pilot must have got the word because he didn't drop him there. And then as he come across, he started wiggling his wings like, I know. And I could see him as he went across here. I could see the pilot. But for some reason or another, when, when the jet's coming in, and I saw him more than once, it seems like they're just hanging. When they get ready to fire and they're right alongside you, it looks like they're just sitting there hanging in the air. And the pilot, you know, if he's already let go of his ordinance, he'll, he looks over toward us or whatever. And you can almost always see him with their goggles net on. And they're a lot, sometimes they go like that to, you know, the ground troops. They were, the, the flyboys were supporting us. They were good to us. Um, we would do anything to protect them. And they'd do anything to protect us. But anyway, that was another instance. Um, those are about the biggest ones I can think of. There were other skirmishes where, you know, they'd start shooting and I'd hit the ground. But okay. um, Now, one of the things that, that you did to kind of to prepare for this interview was to actually go back through the unit history and so forth. And you were mentioning to me at some point there was a particular action involving aerial bombardment or something like that where uh, the account didn't give the whole story. In, on Ganoa Island, um, we were in a company perimeter for the night. And it was, again, one of these no-name operations on Ganoi Island or a sub, you know, a sweeping operation. But we were set for the night in our company perimeter and uh, or our platoon perimeter or our platoon in the company, whatever. Mm -hmm. And about 1 o'clock in the morning, I got a radio call from one of the squads. They, they see campfires. To, I think it was to the north. So the lieutenant and I, we go over to the perimeter and we get in Fox over the guy and we look. He gets binoculars, sure enough, about... A thousand meters out, you can see all these campfires, big ones. It's obviously not us. It's the NVA. And right off the bat, we know it's a rouge because they know we're here. They're not going to build campfires. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to get somebody's attention to figure out what's going on. Well, what we did then is, first thing we did is we alerted the other, the south end of the perimeter that keep your eyes open. There's something going on, and it may be coming your way. Meanwhile, we call in Puff the Magic Dragon and he saturates those campfires. If there was anybody over there building them, they didn't survive. Because Puff, they put down one round every square foot. And they can cover a football field in like four seconds or something. And can you explain what, what Puff was for the benefit of the audience? At this point in time, Puff was, this one was a C-47 converted to, it had miniguns in it. And what they would do is they would fly at a bank around a circle. And they would shoot, and they'd do it in such a way that all the firepower would come to a certain point. So it was like a funnel. Mm -hmm. The pilot would just continually fly in a circle, and all the rounds go down. And you'd see a red line go. Well, those are tracers, but in between every tracer, there are four other rounds. You don't see those. You just see the tracers. From a distance, it looks like a red line, and you hear burp, burp. Mm -hmm. And there'd be a red line going down. And before that tail end of the red line hits the ground, here comes another one. And they just keep circling it. They did that for probably 10 minutes. So there was, there was no chance anybody was alive down there, if there was anybody there to begin with. We would, I would think that they knew what we were going to do, and they would just light them and get the heck out of Dodge, because they knew we were going to retaliate, either with artillery or air or something. But while that's going on, um, that was like at 1 o'clock. So we had, everybody was on alert. The whole line, the whole perimeter was on alert. Nobody was sleeping. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, the south end perimeter, one of, we got a call from the squad. They have movement in front of them. Well, we figured something's going to happen somewhere, so here comes the movement. And it was, oh, 20, 30 meters in front of them. And they, they kept watching and kept getting closer, and they started seeing bodies in the moonlight and whatnot. And they were crawling on their bellies to get to us. And then about 3 o'clock, I don't know if somebody blew a whistle or a horn, they all got up, and they were charging. Well. Machine, our machine gunners, the M60 guys and everything, were ready for them. Um, the first guy in the front, it, well, all of them actually were carrying Chicom grenades, which is a concussion grenade. It doesn't have a lot of shrapnel. It's a homemade grenade, and it's wrapped around their They got a, a belt of them around their waist. Well, the machine gunner, as soon as the first guy jumped up, he hit him right in the belly and detonated one of those grenades, which blew the others. And it actually, we found out later, blew him in half. All his insides are gone. We never did find that. We just found the two body cavities, top and bottom. We buried him. Uh, when we buried him the next day, we buried his head between his feet, just as to be ornery, I guess. But anyway, 
So they're attacking, and uh, through this battle, now I'm I'm in a bomb crater, holding two radios because the other radio operator took off a lieutenant to go down to the squad where the fighting was. So I'm by myself in this bomb crater, and there are leaves dropping as the bullets are hitting the trees above me, and I've got one radio in each each hand talking to one. I think I was talking to company, and the other was battalion, keeping them track of what was going on. And I'm trying to be as calm as I can as I'm ducking into my flak jacket and trying to figure out, you know, I hope nobody comes in front of me because there's no way I'm going to be able to defend myself with two handsets. And I just, it was one of those, when you look back, it was kind of comical because I was just calmly talking to him saying, we're taking this, uh, rounds are getting closer. Uh, I just got hit in the head with a branch. Um, we have more, we're taking a couple mortar rounds now. Um, most of the firing seems to be coming out of the northwest or northeast or whatever. Um, and then the lieutenant would call me on the company one and tell me what's going on, and then I'd relay that to battalion. And meanwhile, the battalion was getting a re uh, reaction force ready to come to us at first light. That would have been about 5, 530 in the morning when we get first light. And uh, so the firefight went on all night long from 3 o'clock to 530 or so. They never did get in the perimeter. We had a couple of scratches and a couple of guys, so we really come out okay on this. Mm -hmm. Next day we counted like 20, I think it would, my record recollection was like 25 dead bodies. The, the history is saying 24. Mm -hmm. But the tragic part about it is near the tail end, we called in our own 81 mortars. And they started dropping around, but the first round they hit dropped inside our perimeter. Now, our corpsmen had been up and around checking guys all night. You know, the fighting had stopped. The, the shooting had pretty much stopped. So they went back to lay down on their ponchos just under this tree under the daylight. First round landed about a foot and a half above their heads in this tree and blew both their heads off. Um, for the benefit of their families, I'm not going to say who they were, but mm -hmm. I had to go back, or I went back because I knew them, I went back and I picked up the parts and put in the in the ponchos and wrapped them up. They were intact, but it it pretty much took off this part here on. Um, so that was a bad day. Yeah. So you saw your share of, of pretty ghastly stuff in, in that time. How long did it take you to get used to it, or did you get used to it? I don't think you ever did. You buried it, and I think. Uh, you know, a lot of guys do. That's why you have a lot of people with problems. Mm -hmm. They've buried all that because you don't have time to think about it. It's like you got to react. So, yep, he's dead. It's his turn. It's his time. You go on to whatever. Um, so that was that was one instance there. There was another thing I just thought of. During Gunnow Island, we had a we were at another base or another patrol area where we another perimeter, and it was raining, just pouring. And 81 mortars were shooting illumination rounds out because we had movement out in front of us. And I was on radio watch. We had dug a small hole for two people, about six feet long and about 16 inches deep and maybe four feet wide. And it was starting to fill up with water, but we're laying in it. Because, and then we had the poncho across it as a tent. We had the radio watch in there. It was myself and the platoon sergeant. So we're sharing radio watch, trying to get a cat nap in between back and forth. 81s are shooting their loom rounds. Well, all of a sudden, they go to drop one down a tube, and it must have had wet increments. It just went up, and they were like this end of the wall, and then we were at that end of the wall. It just went up, over, and came down through the poncho and landed between our heads. Now, it did not detonate, but it splattered enough mud in the platoon sergeant's ears that we had to medev med medevac him. But when it hit, you know, he's here and I'm there, it hit. And we both looked at each other and said a few words and got out. I, don't, I didn't even take the radio with me. We just got out of there. And uh, I have a picture of that in the dark. It was, I don't know, like midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning when that dropped. But that was, that was another hairy. That was probably the last hairy one. Okay. Now, you're talking about the, this particular island. Sort of what was it? Where was it? This was uh, south of Dang. It was called uh, Operation Allenbrook, Ganoi Island. Mm -hmm. Any Marine that was with the 27th Marine Regiment at that point in time remembers it because all companies from all battalions eventually rotated in and out of there. It was an NVA staging area for attacks on Da Nang. 
um, the 38th infantry, the 38th and the 36th NVA regiments were down there, full co hardcore regulars, and they were not apt to run away like the Viet Cong would. They would stand and fight, and that's what cost us a lot of battles. They would wait until we were right on top of them, and then ambush us, and then. They knew we couldn't call in airstrikes, and we were reluctant to call in supporting fire because we were so close. So they would, and then they would start to envelop us and come around the sides. Um, we had one uh, one of our platoons. Well, let me back up. During Allen Brook, there was a, and I don't know exactly when, but the company radio operator got wounded. I was the next one chosen to become company radio operator. So I become company radio operator. The next day, the guy that I chose to be my replacement, because they asked me, oh, who do you recommend? And always, so I uh, recommended a uh, Lance Corporal Lamphere. The next morning, they go out on patrol at 8 o'clock. Uh, it was a platoon patrol. They weren't gone 30 minutes. I hear, we hear an explosion, because they're, they're not more than 50, 500 meters away. And that's like uh, half a mile. So it's really fairly close. They tripped a booby trap. Well, he tripped it and it went off behind him. So the radio absorbed most of the, of the shrapnel. But it got him in the back of his legs and his arms. Um, the flak jacket here protected his neck. So he, he really just got a lot of, of little shrapnel in his legs and that. His torso was protected by the radio and the radio was scrapped. But it also took out the lieutenant. Uh, he got hit in the, enough that they had a medevac him and it took out the corpsman. So Doc Kirkpatrick was medevac. O'Rourke was medevaced. Um, and I haven't seen them since, but I understand they're both still alive. Mm -hmm. I've talked to them. So. All right. Uh, now, when you're conducting, so this, this operation, this Allenbrook, this particular operation that you ran, was this an effort to try to actually clear out the island? And it was an effort to eradicate the NVA from this island mm -hmm. to, because they were staging for an attack on Da Nang. So our job was to go down there as, a, as the operation to clear the island and remove the threat to Da Dang. Uh, the three, 304th, I, I forgot what NVA division was building strength down there to attack Da Nang and mm -hmm. the second Tet, if they want to call it that, is what intelligence was telling us. So, so how large a force did you take? Was it a battalion size? Yeah, it was, it's, it was, they rotated units out and in. And I think it started with another... Um, I want to say the third Marines or somebody was in there first. Mm -hmm. Then the 27th Marine Regiment rotated in one battalion at a time. And then uh, at one point in time, they had all two or three of our battalions in there. It was getting that heavy. Um, it was We were in battles just about every day during that operation. Somebody was getting under fire and had to be rescued, if you want to put it that way. Okay. Now, since this was sort of an island, I mean, was this off of the it coast really, or in the rivers? No, or? It, it was really... The island name was kind of bogus. It was in the middle, it was south of Da Nang in the rice paddies. There was one river that went around one side, but there were canals on the other. Mm -hmm. So it, in a sense, I guess it was an island, but yet it was basically an area with waterways near it. And it was, they called it an island. They called it Gonoi Island. Okay. But it was the sort of thing where they could filter in and out of it. Yes. It wasn't isolated as it would be if it were off the coast. No, kind of it thing. was easy access to it. I mean, uh, and there were troops coming in. NVA troops had been there for quite a while. During our search and destroy operation, we discovered hospitals, R&R &R centers, um, barracks, mess halls, uh, a lot of caches of uh, rice and food, weapons, ammunition. We discovered an awful lot. They finally sent engineers in there with bulldozers and their job was to flatten the island. Mm -hmm. All the villages that are around there were all fortified. It was just like you'd have a fort underneath and you'd have all the, the huts and everything on top. So their orders were to go in there and flatten it. So we, we eventually got that done. Um, but once O'Rourke was removed, I thought he'd, I didn't think he came back. Well, no, he never did come back after that one. I'll back up a little bit. While we were up in um, Way, there was an operation where he got hit in the head in, the, in one of these sweeps that we did, and it went through one side, and it came out this side. 
It never did. It, you know, I saw two bullet holes in there, and, and he's telling me that the bullet stayed in the helmet and came around. But I remember two bullet holes in the helmet. One went in this side, it came around the liner and came out. And I remembered him being med medevac there, but I didn't remember him coming back until I got an email from him telling me, no, I came back. It wasn't until we tripped a booby trap in Gunnar Island that I left when you left me and I think it was Captain Sweeney took me as his radio operator and that's when I picked Lem Fear to be the mm -hmm. platoon radio operator. And I had forgot all about that until I got an email from him after researching uh, for this interview. Um, I found the dock up in Minnesota, O'Rourke down in uh, Texas. But uh, um, I lost my place where I was going. Mm -hmm. It's your turn. Okay. Uh, now, you also have talked about what you refer to as sort of no-name operations. These are sort of just small-scale yeah, these patrols. Are the, and these are the hammer and sickle, um, where the, today um, two companies are going to sweep, mm -hmm. and they would pick different areas of the, of the island, uh, in this case on the island, that we need to sweep through. Intelligence says there's been a, a large force of movement in NVA and Viet Cong in such and such a village then they would move a company in behind them either by helicopter or march them in during dark to get them in position behind. And then the other two would march in position and then uh, sweep. Yeah. Now, uh, what percentage of the time was that kind of thing successful? I mean, would you actually find somebody in between your companies? On Ganoa Island, just about every one of them was successful. We, mm -hmm. we had contact with all of them. Um, Ganoa Island, every day you heard gunfire. Somebody, somebody on the island was fighting somebody. Um, I've got some pictures showing where we're in a tree line along a fence and we're watching about a thousand meters out phantoms dropping napalm to help somebody out there and we don't know who it is. We're on our own radio frequency and the only frequency we have is with battalion. So as a company radio operator I got battalion so I can hear the other companies talk to battalion and ask for this or that um, and then I can also hear our, our platoons talking to me. The platoons in turn and their their squads would all talk, and I can hear them. And then on the battalion net, I can hear the co the other companies, and I can hear them, you know, call in air at coordinates such and such. Okay. Now you're in kind of an unusual situation in that sense, I and mean, you've got a little bit better idea of what's going on than a lot of the other ordinary soldiers mm -hmm. would in a lot of these situations. What was your impression of just how well the military was functioning at that point in terms of coordination and cooperation between these different branches and units? We had good coordination. The only thing we had um, was sometimes we'd have, because of the heat of battle, you get misidentification. More than once, friendly fire would take somebody out, mm -hmm. whether it be an aircraft coming in like it almost did with us, or 81s like it did with the corpsman. Um, more than once, you'd hear where, you know, cease fire, friendly fire, you're firing on friendly troops in this net. Didn't happen all the time, every day but it was not unusual to hear it, whether somebody miscalculated or misidentified somebody, or somebody didn't load the tube with the right number of increments, because when you load an 81 or 60 millimeter mortar, you drop little bags of uh, powder down, and then you drop the round down, and that ignites those, and that tells it how far it's gonna go. All right, uh, if you put in a call for air support or artillery or whatever, uh, how quick was the response usually? Well, on air, depending who's on station, uh, most of the time it wasn't hard to get it because it seemed like the air was full of aircraft. Um, the only time you, you had trouble with air and artillery was artillery couldn't fire if air was in the area. So if you were getting artillery support, it had to stop if air was coming in. But really, uh, any operation you had, you were always covered by artillery. They were somewhere. And they could be within 20 miles and still cover you. Um, there was, uh, we had one, we were attacking a tree line one time in Way, and we were taking fire from a pagoda, which is a church. There was a machine gun nest in it, and we called in artillery. And that was my first instance of seeing our artillery fire. They were shooting air bursts, and some of the air bursts were firing, detonating behind us instead of in front of us. So you're sitting on the ground, and anytime you got artillery firing overhead, you get down. You know, you don't stand up. You get down flat on the ground. And uh, air bursts are interesting. I mean, it's like fireworks. All of a sudden you see a puff, and you know before you see the puff that the shrapnel is already scattered. Or they have rounds that will come over, and they'll detonate three feet off the ground. So they're like a daisy cutter. They cut everything down. 
and some will be hard bombs or artillery that will just dig a hole in the ground and blow. Um, it was not hard to get support. It was there. Those cannon cockers were always ready. We were never, to me, we were never denied fire for any reason. And some of it was really quick. Some of it might have taken a bit because they may have been on another mission shooting over somewhere else, and now we need it, but they're finishing off over here. Um, we were never told they couldn't fire due to short of ammunition. They always had plenty of artillery. Um, even when I was up north in uh, the DMZ area, we had fire bases, and they were always resupplied. But down in Da Nang, um, again, the camaraderie was there, whether it was Air Force or Marines flying those jets up there, or Navy, because there was always... There was always something up there and the same with helicopters um, they're always doing something you might be on Gano Island of a firefight and we're 6,000 meters south of Da Nang itself and they're doing resupply missions maybe far west of you or out east of you or even south to the, Cur the south of us with the uh, Korean Army uh, South Korean Army mm -hmm. um, they had a TAOR south of us so they they could be resupplying them with something but if we call in a medevac those resupply birds, whoever's available, they're going to come in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand one time during Allenbrook, we called in for an emergency medevac, and the general, 3rd Marine, uh, well, the, the highest ranking Marine Corps general in theater was on that bird. He was on an inspection. They diverted, they come in and took our medevac out with him on board. It wasn't our company, but one of the other companies, mm -hmm. I, I read about that. And that's just how... If you got a medevac, everything stops. Get them and get them out of there. And that's why I think our casualty rate were a lot lower than World War II because we did have good medevac capabilities. Mm -hmm. And I saw on the hospital ship when I was on it, uh, we had medevacs coming in every hour. And it would be all different types of helicopters, too, from the old uh, um, Korean-era bird, Marine Corps birds, to mm -hmm. Hueys, to Chinooks, to C-46s, to these little... Loach, um, Boeing op, um, observation ones. Mm -hmm. You'd see a wounded guy sitting in his seat and, and a pilot. Whatever it takes to get him, they're going to get him, um, whether they got corpsmen on board or not. It just depends on the on the whether it was a routine priority or emergency. Routine was you know when you get a chance, stop and get this guy. Like the the platoon sergeant, he was a routine. He wasn't in danger of dying. It wasn't critical but it needed to be medevac. So the next resupply chopper that came in, we put him on it and sent him back. Priority is one that um, they're not in danger in dying now, but like you got a bullet wound in the leg, you're not, you're not going to bleed to death because we've got a tourniquet, so that's a priority. You need to get out of here for infection. Emergency is they're in, they're in dire straits. They've they got a sucking chest wound or something, and if we don't get them out of here right now within the hour to... Uh, you know, within minutes to a hospital for surgery, he's gone. So there's, but as far as the inner cooperation and how fast to get him, mm -hmm. well, I never experienced any problems. They were always there for us. And I think that gave us a sense of safety, a sense of, uh, it took the edge off a little bit about being alone, because mm -hmm. you always knew there was somebody back there to help you. I had a, when I was first there in, a, in uh, the platoon, or in a squad, and was in a foxhole one night, the, uh, platoon sergeant comes up and I asked him, I said, when are we going to get some more people in these foxholes? You know, we're pretty thin out here. I mean, if they hit us with a company charge or even a platoon charge, we're toast. He said, just remember this, for every Marine that's in a foxhole, there are 16 others in the supply chain supporting you, making sure you get all you need. And I looked at him and I said, all I really need right now is about three more of them in this hole with me. <laughs> and years later, when I went to Iraq, I remembered that. I said, this time I'm going over his logistics and not in a foxhole. Now you spend the, about the first half or so or a little more of that of your tour with, with the 27th Marines. Mm -hmm. You're conducting these kinds of operations and that's fairly active. Uh, and then you transfer to a different unit? In, on September 12th, the 1st Battalion, 27th Marines folded their flag and went home part of the President's de-escalation, I guess you call it. Mm -hmm. What really happened was everybody that was still had a long-term uh, to be there got transferred up to the, um, I think it was 1st Marine Division up near Dong, uh, Dong Hong Quang Tree. All those that were on their second tour, short timers and whatever, they, they went home with a flag. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, it was, there wasn't 20 people that went home with a flag. 
the rest of them joined them in uh, uh, Hawaii or Okinawa on the way out. So as people were going home, they just transferred them in. So the people who were in the parades and everything in San Diego later, mm -hmm. they were none of them were really 27 Marine Regiment. The people that were actually, you know, took care of the flag were still in theater. The flag came home and somebody else was watching it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, on the 12th, we had a, um, we flew to Quang Tree or Dong, I think it was Quang Tree because both of them are real close together. I, I, I think Quang Tree is the north. We flew into Dong Ha Air Base mm -hmm. and then they trucked us to Quang Tree because the rear area is in Quang Tree for right. the 4th Marine Regiment. And up there I was with uh, uh, Bravo Company, 1st uh, Battalion, 4th Marines. And I stayed with them for the remainder of my tour. Okay. Now, uh, what kind of activities were you involved in at that point? Because you had suggested earlier that it was somewhat different from your well, experience. Well, in, in Da Nang, it was the rice paddies. In a lot of villages, a lot of contact with villagers. Um, up near Quang Tree and Dung Hall, it was the north. There were no villages out in the jungle. Any villages that were out there were evacuated. It was a free fire zone. If you saw somebody, whether, no matter who they were, you shot them. Because that was enemy territory considered. And everybody knew, all the villagers and everything knew that these areas are free fire. And uh, there's no mongoloids up there, mountain people or anything. They're all mm -hmm. to the south near Saigon. So anybody you saw up there walking around was a bad guy. And he was open to eradication. Okay. Now, were you physically in jungle or forest, or was it more open country where you were? No, it was jungle. Um, when we first landed, of course, we spent the first day or two getting acclimated, and they were signing a, it, I came up with a truckload, and they're, um, they're assigning us to our units. Well, my unit was the, uh, I think it was the first, first or third platoon, I forget right now. But anyway, we had to take a convoy up to what they called LZ Stud, which is Vandergriff Combat Base on Route 9. On that, they put us on trucks. I happened to get on a load of artillery rounds on this convoy. And we're going on Highway 9, past the rock pile, round to uh, LZ Stud. LZ Stud was the jump off point when they uh, secured uh, Quezon from the siege. LZ Stud was the supply base for that. Anyway, we're going, we're, we're going uh, that route. Well, you're, we're going through the mountains and you're going on dirt roads and there's, every so often you see a, a squad or whatever protecting a bulldozer as they're repairing a hole in the road or whatever. And it made us feel really good as we're going along these cliffs and we're looking down and we can see junk trucks tipped over and cargo alongside the mountainside, it's like, and we're on an ammo truck? It was one of those comical things. You think about it then, it's like, and all you're thinking about, which way do I jump if something hit, if I see something coming, which way do I jump? I don't want to jump on this side, I'm going to go down a cliff. If I jump on this side, I'm just going to hit the wall and fall back under the wheels. You know, it's like, what are you going to do? But we get to the base, and it's still, it's still twilight, and I'm assigned to a unit the platoon is a mile further down nine past the base right where highway nine makes a direct turn to the west because we've gone from from um, Quang Tree, the rear area we went up a little bit and then we went straight west past the rock pile camp carroll and contien mm -hmm. and then we turned south into lz stud and on the south side of that another mile is where highway nine turned west to go to Quezon. Well, where that turn is, there was a platoon base camp. A lot of effort were put into it, a lot of concertina wire, heavy communications bunker, other bunkers around there. I mean, it was built to stay there, and it was right on the corner of the road. So I was assigned to that. I think one, I don't remember if I was the only one or there was another one. But right away, I was assigned to the radio section because radio operators were high-priority targets, so we were short. So. I ended up being a platoon radio operator, or working with the platoon radio operator. There's two of us in this case. And uh, the second night we're there, we're on radio watch in the middle of the night. Now, we never got hit or anything there, never, no probing or anything in that. Area. Evidently, there was no NVA units in the vicinity. Um, there might have been some up on the mountains watching, but none down there where we were. But the second night we're there, we're on radio watch, and a Marine comes in, and He's locked and loaded. He's going to shoot everybody in the side of his bunker. And he's got it loaded, and he's looking at the lieutenant, because the lieutenant was, had been there before I was, and so I was a new guy on the block. Well, the radio, op radio operator, the other one, was on duty, 
and I was over in the corner on my bunk, and I'm watching this guy come in. He's locked and loaded. He's got it, and he's aiming, and he's screaming and hollering, I ain't going to do this anymore. I'm not going out there. You can't make me, and blah, blah, blah. He's, he's going bananas. So I fall off of my bunk, and I crawl out the door with this other guy that's next to me. We go around. We get the platoon sergeant who's out checking a perimeter and bring him around to the other door. And uh, we're going to try to get this guy from behind before he does some damage. And as it comes back, we disarmed him and sent him to the rear. And that was in, that would have been in September. And when I went to the rear in February, he was still there. They were told, you don't talk to him. He doesn't go on any details. He was under, I don't know, some court injunction or something, but he wasn't going home. But he wasn't going to the battle. He wasn't going to fight. He wasn't going to leave the base. He was just going to eat and sleep, and that's all he did. And he was told to be left alone. How he survived that, I don't know, because there was a, more than one fragging instance in the rear for people that were putting other people in jeopardy in the field. But this guy survived. Anyway, so that first, that was the second night. And then we got pulled back to uh, LZ Stud with the rest of the company. And then from that point on, a few days later, next thing I know, we're, we're out on an operation, um, I want to say south west of Quezon Combat Base. We're doing a search uh, operation looking for ammo dumps, mass graves, uh, things like that, or current troops or whatever. Um, there was, I don't know what the name of the operation, I think it was Lancaster too, but I'd have to look at my records on that. But we were out there doing all that. And we did that pretty much tours like that for the rest of the uh, time I was there. All right, now, as you were doing this, uh, now, but there was significantly less fighting then than there was? Yeah, we didn't, uh, like the first one we hit, um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't have any contact that I can recall um, we would, we'd set up, you know, we were choppered into a, a hilltop that had been blown away. And of course, you set up your perimeter right away and more troops come in. And then from there, we would single file through the jungle, a certain path or whatever they projected. One night we were sitting there and we were going to stay in this one place uh, for a couple of days. We set out, because I was company right over there, I didn't go. But we sent out platoons for different patrols around the, the area. So we were like, like the base camp in the jungle and they went all over. And it was one day that the 60 mortar team was just lobbing mortars over the cliff into the area around us in case there was somebody down there that was starting to form up. We'd do a little harassment of our own. And uh, they lobbed one round down and hit, an, hit a gook ammo dump down there. There was other 60 mortar rounds down there and they landed right in the middle of them. All of a sudden, just all kinds of explosions down there, like, whoa, what did we hit here, you know? And uh, we sent a patrol down after it cooked off, and sure enough, there was a, there was a, a little hut, and they had 60-millimeter mortar rounds lined up on it, on the shelves for protection and packed in cosmoline or whatever, and we hit it. And it just secondary explosions for 10, 15 minutes. It was great. We loved it. And then... Um, that continued on for a while, and uh, they pulled us off that operation, took us up to LZ Stud for a couple of days, and then we went to, I don't remember the sequence, but we were, there's three fire bases in that area, LZ Russell, which we closed, LZ Gurkha, which was an LZ all the way as far north as you can go in South Vietnam and as far west. Mm -hmm. So it, you could look out to the north and you can see the highest mountain in, in the Vietnam. You could look to the west, and at night we could see the convoys in the Ho Chi Minh Trail going south in Laos. And they were like 8,000 meters away, and we were up on this hill, and we could see them 8,000 meters away at night. They got their headlights on, six at a time. About every 15 minutes you'd see six, and we couldn't touch them. Those are supplies and troops going south of the enemy, and we couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Didn't set well with us. One a point in time there while we were there, uh, it's decided we're going to run a, an ambush about 1,500 meters, 2,000 meters to the west. So in the early morning, we take off. We're good, we go down through the, the perimeter wire and past the Claymore's net. And uh, there's a bald knoll over here they're going through. It It looks just like a, a hay field, I mean, basic. We get over there, and it's elephant grass, 12 to 15 feet tall. And we're walking through this stuff. 
And if you didn't keep your eyes on a guy in front of you, you couldn't walk 10 feet apart or you'd lose each other. And we're following this. I don't know if we were following a trail or we cut a trail. I don't remember. But I do know going along it, all of a sudden, one of the guys alerted, beware of hole. So we're, we're moving on, and all of a sudden I come up, and there's this hole in the ground. It's about three feet across in diameter, and it's perfectly circular, and you couldn't see the bottom. And all we could surmise is it was a, a big bomb that came out of B-52 that didn't detonate, and it came straight down and just dug a hole in the clay, and somewhere it was down there. And one of the guys says, let's drop a hand grenade down there. That could be a, a gook hole. And I looked at him, I says, yeah, but what if it's a 2,000-pound bomb and you drop it down there? You can't run fast enough. Oh, yeah, you're right. Let's get the hell out of here. So we just got out of there. But that was one of the comical times that we had. We had a, you always try to make levity of, of the dangerous times just to break the, the uh, ice, if you want to call it that. All right. Now, at a certain point where, while you were in Vietnam, you got pretty sick, didn't you? Yeah, if this was up in the 4th Marine area while we were doing the searching and that. Um, resupply was hard, so we were going days without getting resupply. So water got, we ran out of water, ran out of halazone tablets. And every so often, you, mountain streams, you come across one, and they're flowing pretty fast. And the water was really good. And, and you, you're pretty safe on drinking mountain water because it's, it's pure. Well, there's a stream, and I thought it was running fast. It wasn't that big. It was only about so wide. And I thought it was moving fast enough, and it was pooling here and there. So I fill up my canteen, and I didn't have any halzone tablets, and I had some water, which a few weeks later turned out to be dysentery. But, you know, it's either that, or at that point in time, it was a heat stroke because it was so hot. And uh, that was at the beginning of the monsoon season. So... Um, during, after we did all our searches in this net, they finally put us into what they call firebase rotation, sort of. We'd be on this firebase for two weeks, and we'd go over to this one, and then that one. During the monsoon, the rainy season. <clears throat> and this was, we're into October now, um, latter October, first November. And uh, I can remember um, having the, bloody shits. I, I hate to say it that way, but that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. I couldn't eat anything. I couldn't drink anything. It immediately come out. It went right straight through me like a hose. And I lost a lot of weight. And uh, I knew I had something wrong. The corpsman says, you know, I don't know what it is. Uh, take your malaria pills, because we took those and salt pills every day. So that went on for almost a month, six weeks. So like the and that, that started in October, so I think it was, I want to say, the latter part of November before Thanksgiving, because I was on the hospital ship for Thanksgiving. So I'm saying mid-November, we get this message from the rear. I'm to report to the rear. I have been chosen to become the mail orderly. Cherry job. I love this. Get me out of the bush. Get me out of sleeping under the stars. Get me out of the rain. So I go to the rear. Next supply chopper comes in. I got my backpack and everything and I turn the radio over to somebody else and say goodbye to them and say, I see you guys in the rear I'm gonna make sure you get your mail though so I go to the rear and I spend the night in the tent get up the next morning I'm gonna go to sick call and see what's going on I need some pills or something so I walk in and there's 12 people there and I just get in line I sit there and it's pretty soon my turn comes up and I go in and see the corpsman and I tell him what's going on he says just bend over and does his thing uh, Take this piece of paper and go sit on that bench. Okay, Doc, what's the problem? You've got a meabiasis. It's a form of uh, uh, malaria. It's called dysentery. You're going to the hospital ship. I didn't even know we had hospital ships offshore. I figured the only hospitals are ones on ground. <coughs> Excuse me. As it turned out, we had two hospital ships on shore out, out there that would rotate every three days. They'd go up near Wei in Dong Ha, and they'd circle for three days to take in casualties. Then they'd go back to Da Nang for refueling, and then the other one would go up, so they were rotating every three days. So anyway, so the next bird comes in. They put me on it with a couple other guys, and we go out to the USS Repos. So we go through the process. They check you in. They take all your clothes. Of course, mine are tathers, and I look like I hadn't taken a bath in a month, and I hadn't probably longer than that. Uh, I don't even think I shaved for two and a half weeks. 
Somebody took a picture of my beard, and I'd never seen it. It's the only time I ever had a beard. But uh, got on the USS Repose. First thing they did was um, take my clothes, had me do a shower, and they put, you, put this hospital gown on you, which is nothing more than a half a bed sheet with the back door open, and put me in bed. Clean sheets felt good. I slept for the first, and for the first three days, I got fed in bed. I was, uh, and I slept pretty much for the first three days. I didn't get out of bed. It was great. And then they, I became ambulatory so I could help feed the other guys that were in there. We were in a ward. I don't know how many were in it, but it was a pretty big ward on ship. So I spent th four weeks on a hospital ship because I spent Thanksgiving on a hospital ship. I remember that. And then they had a USO show come on one time. I, don't, I think they were from Australia. So they were on for one night. But I remember because we'd go back and forth. And while I'm on the hospital ship, my platoon... I don't know if it was just the, comp the whole company or just the platoon. I think it was just the platoon got pulled out of the bush and got three days on the USS New Jersey as Liberty. They're on the USS New Jersey waving at me while I'm on the repos waving at them. And I didn't know it at the time. And, uh, I mean, when you look at a battleship at sea and you see these little things on top of those gun turrets, it makes those gun turrets look awfully big. I took a bunch of pictures of it coming in the distance and he came right alongside of us, and we're both going like this, but he's faster, and he's just going around in a circle. And uh, they're all over there waving at us and this and that. It was, it was great. I wish I would have been on there instead of a hospital ship. But I was in a hospital ship for 30 days, got off that, um, got off, left off in Da Nang, uh, got picked up by a tra I grabbed transportation to take me back to Camp Dong Song, or not Camp Dong Song, but back to Quang Tree, where our regimental uh, area was. And... Uh, got back there and before they put me back with my unit they had an operation going on and they were grabbing everybody anybody that could fire a weapon even if you hadn't you know you didn't belong to whatever they put you together in this ad hoc group and uh, it was going to we were going to circle a village that they had reports of a deserter african-american and a deserter white guy in this village with some Viet Cong and some MVA so in the middle of this rainstorm, in the middle of the night, I can't see from me to you, and you got your hand on the guy in front of his shoulder, <coughs> and they let us off the trucks, and somebody that can see better than we can, must have had a starlight scope, led the single file of people all the way around this village. Now this village had to be a, well the perimeter was at least a mile in diameter, if not longer. It was probably about a mile and a half. And when daylight came, all of a sudden, there's tanks. We've got a tank. we got two or three tanks in line over here, and there's us, and there's a perimeter going around this way. And, of course, once we got to the ground, we dug holes to start with right, real quick to get into one, and then we improved those after daylight. We were there probably three days, but uh, it was neat watching those tanks fire. They had the big starlight scopes on the tank, so at night they could see long distance, and they'd fire. One night where they were there, and um, I got to know the guys somewhat. I mean, I was a radio operator, and it's always neat to know the radio operator. So they called me over, and, says, and they showed me the screen. They had me crawl up and look at the screen. And there was, this, about a mile out, there was a log. And he says, now watch. And every so often, a head would pop up above that log. One here, one there. There's two gooks out there watching the perimeter. And they found them on a scope. He says, watch this. So they, Oh, I hear the whine of the electric motor that's turning the turret. The turret just goes over a little bit and up. And they line it. And somebody, I don't remember if they said on the way or what, but all of a sudden triggered, a blast went out. And I, he says, keep your eye on the scope. And I watch, and all of a sudden where the log was, just everything disintegrated. And you couldn't see any more there because all the smoke in that. And he says, scratch to Kong. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that was over, they sent us back to... Uh, the rear, and then I finally joined up with my, my company. And at that point in time, I was only platoon radio operator. I never did get back to company radio operator. So I joined my platoon. I think that was on Firebase Gurkha. Yeah, that would have been on Firebase Gurkha. And then that's when I we went on the patrol toward Laos when mm -hmm. we could see it. And then from there, we were moved back to LZ Stud for three days of rest and recuperation and resupply. And then from there, they took us up to LZ Neville, which was still in the north end of the Quezon Valley, but further east, just south of DMZ by maybe three or four clicks. And I spent the rest of our time there. We were there probably 
the last three weeks I was in the field, but the mo most of the month of February. Well, yeah, because I, I didn't go to the rear until March 1st, so most of February we were on LZ Neville, and LZ Neville was a fire base. Now, let me go back. LZ Gurkha was on a grassy knoll, so it was sloped on all four sides, and then the one to the east went down, a trail went down to a water, to a river. And I took some pictures of that as a beautiful setting. It's something you'd want to see in a, in a National Geographic. Mm -hmm. It's really pretty. And then LZ Neville was on top of a mountain, which was all rock, and it came up like a shoe, where one side was really steep and the, the front side was sloped. And uh, that particular fire base, you know, we built a, a, a command bunker on it when we got there which was basically just empty ammo boxes set on end with some steel rails and rope tied around it. I mean, you can't nail anything, so you, you're using rope or twine or whatever. And then we took some ponchos and put them across the top for a roof. So it was pretty neat. We had shelves and everything. We thought we were high tech here. And of course, the front was just ponchos uh, that you could just pull apart. The only problem with it is it was so small that every time a helicopter came in, it'd blow it down because the fire base itself was so small. Um, resupply. It was not unusual for them to come in with a pallet full of sea rations and if they didn't get it just right it would go down the cliff side. And they, were, they said there was more than one pallet of sea rations at the bottom of the cliff. It was a 500 foot cliff. And there was food, ammunition, whatever at the bottom of it. And no one was going down there to destroy it because it was too far down. You'd have to repel because it was so steep. At night we used to just drop grenades over the side every so often just to deter anybody from crawling up. If you heard a noise and it was funny because our CP is right there, and right where the carpet is right there is the, is the, is the end. Mm -hmm. So if they came up, they could just throw a rock and hit us. Um, but that was the last fire base I was on. Um, now, was there much activity there? Or was it well, bad? we did. We thought we had some activity one night. While I was there, we didn't. After I left, they got overrun. But on the, on the slope part, going back in, um, every night we'd have listening posts out. Any place we, any time I was over there in a platoon base at night, we always had listening posts out. A listening post is the same as an observation post, but it's just at night. You're listening for noises. Anyway, they heard noises, so they threw some hand grenades. And all of a sudden, they heard this something running through the jungle down back down the hill. Well, the next night, they had about a dozen rock apes or gorillas come up and start throwing rocks at the guys. They, could, they knew where they were at, and they're throwing rocks at the guys. And the guys, like, called back and said, what do we do? We got these rock apes in front of us throwing rocks. Do we shoot them? You know, no, you don't want to give away your position, so you don't shoot them. You just sit there and duck. If they get too close and they look hostile, they get caught up, you know, where they're coming into your fox, so, yeah, you might want to pull the trigger then and get the heck out of there. Um, the only other thing that happened while we were there is we did run a patrol off where the artillery was, went down... Um, into a ravine and went up this other hill, which was about 1,000, 1,500 meters away. And it was just a, you know how you've got two hills coming down and valleys in between. Well, we went up the hill. We got up halfway up it, and the point man alerted, and it, we all hit the ground. We had walked into an, an NVA bunker complex. It was an older one, and there was nobody there. But they were, we had walked past the bunkers and never saw them. They were that well camouflaged. And I think there was 11 of them in there, and they hadn't been occupied for months. You could tell by the weeds growing up in this net. So we reported that and turned around and went back to the base. And then uh, around March 1st, I got uh, pulled off that base because I was a short timer. I had 30 days left, and they take you out of combat, and they put you in the rear. So my last 30 days was in uh, the rear as the NCOIC in charge of transit. Basically, every other night you have perimeter guard duty. Um, during the day, it's, you know, if somebody new came in, re replacements, I'd take them to supply, get their weapons and their flak jacket and everything, get them ready to go. And then when the time came, I'd take them down to the LZ and go to operations and say, I got two going to LZ Gurkha or two to LZ Neville or whatever. So the next bird that's coming in for resupply for Neville would put the two guys on it. You know, we'd call them ahead of time on the landline, and the landlines are those cranky jobs. Mm -hmm and call them and say, you know, when's your next LZ, your next flight going out to LZ Gurkha or whatever for resupply? Because over there, that's all they did in the LZ was put cargo nets out and fill them up with pallets and this and that for wherever they got to go. 
So they tell us we take them over there. Um, in my last 30 days, every other night's guard duty. Um, one night, not on guard duty, um, we got hit. 82 millimeter mortars are coming in. And I don't know what time of the morning, because you don't sleep sound. You sleep, but you're, it's like your body has always got that sound system on. I heard a thump. And then all of a sudden, I hear an explosion, and it's not that far away. So right away, I know it's mortars coming in. I don't know from which direction or where they're dropping yet. I stick my head out the tent, and where because the, the army is providing perimeter for us, and we provide perimeter. That way, you're not in your own area. Mm -hmm. You're a mile or two miles away from where you normally sleep. So I look out, and there's an army bunker out there, and I know there's three or four guys in it. And the next round drops in front of that. Well, the rounds are coming down. These new guys are all the way to the other end of our tent in our incoming bunker to the other end. We have a big underground bunker, which is just a trench with a lot of uh, um, steel grating on top covered with about six layers of sandbags. So the top's about that thick. And uh, I'm thinking, do I want to go down the bunker? I don't really want to go down. The rounds aren't that close. They're, they're like from here to the, to the bank in front of us dropping. And I get my boots, get my pants. And I'm walking down. I get all the way to the other end, and the third round drops. I'm counting. They're 11,000 meters out there. So they're shooting from 11,000 meters, which is like eight miles out mm -hmm. or whatever. So I'm looking for these other guys, and I can't find them. It's like I knew they ran down here. I look down in the bunker and with my flashlight and look at the other. They're way the other end of the bunker, and they are so tight in there that you could put a, make a sandwich out of them. They're just, and they're shaking like can be. And I'm thinking, God, I was like that a year ago. Mm -hmm. So, but the third round, they had sighted this bunker, and the gooks just walked it right into the bunker. The third one ran, lay, landed at the door of the bunker and took out two of the people there. They sent an ambulance in and picked them up. The only other exciting thing was uh, on guard duty, on the perimeter. We, had, we kept hearing movement in front of us. There was a creek that ran in front of us. The Army ammunition dump was over here, and they had a big tower, and the, our, our perimeter went at an angle like this. And the army dump was over here. And we, this creek came around in the bend, and we always heard noises at night, like somebody digging. So one night we requested, uh, reported it. Next night they had an army um, duster, which is a tracked vehicle with 40 millimeter cannon on it, four of them. And he came over here and started firing this way. He just cleared every tree off that bank. I mean, we sat there and watched that in the dark and just loved every minute of it. Boy, he can really cut the trees down. They ought to use him for lumber, you know, cutting lumber down. And then uh, there was noise another night, and I told the, M the uh, M79 grenade launcher guy, throw a couple rounds over in the bank. And he does it, and I said, the machine, our machine gunner said, drop a belt over there, too. All of a sudden, on the radio and the landline, it's somebody screaming, what's all that firing going on? You didn't get permission to fire this and that. I said, well, this is Mr. Maverick, and I just heard noise, and I fired at it. What are you going to do about it? I was getting short, so I didn't <laughs> care. No way they, have, they have, no way they can find us. No way they know who it is. And then as a tail end parting joke, the last night I was on perimeter, I took a patrol out in front. Took eight guys out, and I was the point man. I figured I'm going out in style, and I did. I took them out. We, went, we just went around in front of our perimeter and came back in. We weren't out 30 minutes, I thought. I'm going, but I'm going to go leave in style. And then they uh, flew us by C-130 down to Da Nang. Uh, there was a couple of us going out that day. And when I got out of Da Nang, I met some of the guys that I came in with, because you're all even the same time. Mm -hmm. So here's some of the guys I went to school with. Matter of fact, my roommate was there, uh, uh, Dickman, Richard Dickman. And uh, him and a couple of the other guys we went to school with. And we got to talking, found out a couple of the guys we came over went home. One of them went home with a head wound, and they said he went home as a vegetable. He'll, they don't know if he'll live or not. And we'd lost touch with some of the other guys. But we, we spent like two, two days there in Janang waiting for transport out. And then uh, went back through Okinawa, got more shots. From there, some of us went to uh, El Toro Naval Air Station in, uh, San, down in the L.A. area. And since I was a short timer, if I'd have gone home on 30 days leave and come back, I would only have like two weeks and I'd been discharged. So what they were doing is if you had less than two months left, they just discharged you right down early and sent you home. Okay. Now, before we
get to that phase, let's kind of go back to a couple other dimensions of just sort of life in Vietnam there. One is, how much did you actually get to use your language training while you were there? Once I got on the radio, I think I used it once. The rest of the time was learning how to use the radio, calling reports, calling in artillery, calling in airstrikes. Um, we didn't use my language skills much at all. We had a interpreter with us, a Chu Hoi, or a, uh, if you want to call it a Viet Cong defector, an NVA defector. We used him most of the time. Okay. How much uh, contact did you actually have with the civilian population? Well, a lot of it down there in Da Nang, but when we were up in uh, the uh, Kaysan area and whatnot, we didn't see any civilians. Okay. Well, in Da Nang, I mean, what was what kind of relationship was there between the Americans and the local it population? It depends on the area. The Ganoa Island, it was, uh, you could sense a the hostility. They didn't like us. They wanted us gone or they wanted us dead. Up in Way was totally different. <coughs> when we were at the bridge, guarding the bridge and the water line, and when we first got there, I was in the bunker there, and I went up on the bridge to just check on the guys and see how things are going. And this, actually, one of the guys had to take a break, so I took over his place in Gardner Bridge. And all of a sudden, I hear this scream and a hollering from the village, and this lady walks up on the, on the roadway and comes running toward the bridge. And at that time, half the bridge was a, it was two Bailey bridges, for north, one for northbound traffic, one for southbound. She come running up to me, and she's carrying a baby. And I'm saying a baby, probably about 11 months old, something like that, and it's blue. And I feel it, and it's ice cold, so I know the baby's dead. I, there's nothing to do. And she's yelling at me in Vietnamese so fast, I couldn't understand things she said anyway. But I knew she wanted help for her baby. And there was none. The baby was dead. It had fallen into a bomb crater full of water and had drowned. Mm -hmm. And she was, that was my first encounter with death, if you want to put it that way. Um, I felt bad because I couldn't help her. I couldn't do anything for her. And, you know, all I could do is try to tell her in my broken Vietnamese that, you know, I can't help you. So she went back to the village, and we could hear him wailing in there for a while. Um, but a lot of the patrols um, were positive. You know, it just depends where you're at. Um, you always had to be careful. There was times we'd sweep through a village, and, you know, they wave and shake your hand and this and that. You turn around and sweep back through it, you trigger all the booby traps. While you're going through it, they're setting the booby traps, setting you up, and then when you come back through, you're feeling you know, a little better because they're friendly. You'd have to find booby traps hanging in trees, a sea ration can with a grenade in it and a string attached just waiting for you to trip it and to drop it. Um, I don't think we ever went through a village that we didn't find booby traps. Um, the, uh, when we were up there in Da Nang, I did, we did have contact with villagers now that I'm thinking of it up near Dong Ha. The time we went around that village, mm -hmm. the, the kids would come out to the perimeter looking for candy. And, uh, they seem to be a fairly pleasant lot. When I look at it from my perspective now back, they were just out there scoping us out, finding out where we were at, what we're doing. Because there was one guy came out with a hoe, and he's hoeing weeds. There's no garden or anything anywhere nearby. He's just out there hoeing, watching us. It's like in the, the Arvins that were with us, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, you know, he'd point to him and say, bad guy, get rid of him. So he'd go over and tell him, you know, go away. Any time we had an operation with, an, with the Vietnamese army, we didn't get anything. We didn't find anything. We didn't have any, any luck. We might get ambushed. If they weren't around, we knew we were going to have combat. If the Arvin army all of a sudden disappeared, we knew we were in deep doo-doo. And that happened many, many times. Now, I'm not saying that the whole Viet, uh, Vietnamese army was corrupt, but their leadership, most of it wasn't very good. There was a lot of good ones. I met some good officers mm -hmm. and some good people. But for the most part, and it's just the nature of it, they're, they're from their local civilian population or make up the army. There's going to be some bad ones in there. Not every one of them was, but all it takes is one to get the word out and that we're coming tomorrow. Get out of there. Mm -hmm. Now, how often did you work with, with the Arvins? Was that mostly just around Da Nang? Or mostly. That? It was almost always around Da Nang. Da Nang and Wei, that area. The 51st Army or the 51st Arvin Regiment worked with us down near Da Nang. They were on, uh, I think they were out in Allenbrook with us for a while. Um, and then some of the uh, patrolling there in the 327 area was with them. Right. Uh, now, 
in general, how would you characterize the, the morale of the units you were actually serving with? The time I was there, the morale was high. It was, we didn't, I don't know if we were isolated from all the problems back in the States or not, because one, we didn't get newspapers. Mm -hmm. Two, we didn't get radio reports. We, there was no TV. So we really, it was just the people coming in who were telling us what was going on. Um, occasionally we get the Stars and Stripes, which was the uh, U.S. Ar Armed Forces mm -hmm. uh, newspaper. There we would read about the riots in, in uh, Detroit or whatever. But for the most part, the morale, troops in the field was good, other than we're always complaining about being short of food, short of water, muddy conditions, living conditions. When the hell are we going to get some this or that? Um, but as far as fighting for the war or fighting in the war, mm -hmm. there was very little, if any, uh, anti-war sentiment in our units. Uh, how about just more kind of wearing down, just, just physically, emotionally, psychologically, from being out there for extended periods of time and doing the same stuff over and I over I think again. we got worn down more up there with the 4th Marines and Dong Hall because we were out in the... It was a lot more... It was always wet. You always had a triple canopy. It was always subdued as far as light, so you couldn't see what you're going, what you're doing. And you're always climbing. You're always walking. There were no roads. Where down in Da Nang, you, it, was a little, it wasn't as intense. But down in Da Nang, you were under fire all the time, so you're fighting more. In the DMZ, you're fighting Mother Nature more. Um, and basically, we were picking up the remnants, remnants or the leftovers, of the uh, Battle at Quezon, because we were looking for what was left. And we found graves, dug up graves, got, we could tell who was where, uh, what regiment was buried here by the, their dog tags. And we undercovered lots of ammunition in bunker complexes around Da Nang, or around uh, way, uh, Quezon, I mean. Yeah. All right. Uh, so now you do kind of, you, you get to the end of the tour, and then they bring you back in, into the States. And so where did you wind up uh, landing? I landed in El Toro Naval Air Station in, in uh, near Long Beach, or not near Long Beach, but south of L.A., and got discharged out of there. Um, there was like five of us, they gave our the road that went to the airport with me, it was a whole bus load, but we ended up going through Chicago and then we split. And the bus driver told us that, but when we got on the bus, recommend that you take your uniforms off when you get to the airport and travel in civilian clothes. You don't want to travel in military uniform. They knew you were military by your haircut. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just didn't have long hair, so we stuck out like a sore thumb. Yep. But the sentiment was so anti-military at that point in time, he told us, don't wear your uniform. <clears throat> I had that in the airport, got home, Family was waiting, big sign on the house. Um, readjustment was, in Vietnam, you know, just a few days you're in combat, next thing you know you're at home. So there wasn't a lot of transition time. So the family could be sitting there talking about getting bills paid or the crummy weather or whatever, penny any things, and you're still thinking about Vietnam and the patrol and so-and-so and, -so and uh, the firefight from last night or you know, life-threatening experiences. Um, and that's what hurt a lot of guys. I was lucky. I came home to a, a stable family. Um, my father was a deacon with the Baptist Church. And I'd been, a via, I'd been in the Marine Corps two years, so my four-letter language style did not match the church. So I really had to watch my, my tongue. <clears throat> Marines are noted for their colorful language, and I was no different than the rest of them. So I had to watch it when I got home. I was very cautious about what I said. I always thought before I said anything. Not it was, that it was wrong or anything, but I didn't want to use the colorful language. And uh, getting back to normal took a while. We were, there was one, we had a church softball game. And uh, this other guy, a good friend of mine that I'd grown up with, <coughs> he'd only been back a few weeks. And we were, he was on first base, and I think I was on third, and a car backfired in the parking lot. And we both, we instinctively hit the ground, face in the ground, and grabbed the base as that was going to protect us. And all of a sudden, everybody's just laughing their heads off. It's like, sorry about that, but that's the way it is. You know, you hear a bang, you get down, because that next bang may be too close. And then uh, I got back to dating girls. I asked one uh, uh, young lady for a date that I dated her a couple of years before I left. And her father met me at the door and basically told me he didn't trust me anymore. I'd been to Vietnam, they'd heard about all the horror stories about how we treat young ladies when we come back. We're animals, we rape them and all that good stuff. Never wanted to see me again. 
don't come knocking at the door. So I didn't date him. I didn't go back. But I, I knew other people, so I dated other girls. Um, at some point, you caught up with the one you had the blind date with. Yeah. While I was in Vietnam, all these instances, I would write. I got to tell somebody to get it off my chest. I had to write her. Never wrote anything about it to my folks because I knew they'd, my mother was a worry wart and my father would worry, and I didn't want to do that to him. So far as they knew, things were going pretty good, quiet. I didn't tell him about any combat, any close calls. I didn't want to worry him. I'm doing fine. Keep the letters coming. Packages were infrequent, but that was because it was Vietnam. Well, I, I got with her and dated off and on, not continuously. And then, I don't know, it was about a, six weeks after I was there, uh, got more and more comfortable, and we kept dating. And then uh, eventually, we were at my folks' house one night, and uh, this was classic. Um, this other couple that was at the ball game, he and his girlfriend were there. We were going to go out for pizza. Or I talked to him, and he said, we're going to go for pizza. So I look at her and says, I was going to ask her if we are going to go for pizza, if she'd like a pizza. Instead, I asked, do you want to get married in the backseat of the car? And she looked at me, and she says, don't you mean pizza? And I said, no. you want to get married? Because the guy in front had already asked his girlfriend, and they were going to get married. And she says, yeah. Okay. So the next day, I asked her father, and then I went and asked, told my folks uh, with, by the end of the weekend. So we ended up getting married 18 months after I got home. Um, we've got three kids, four grandchildren, and the fifth one's on its way, be here in December. Um, been married 40 years, doing pretty good. Two years and she retires in two years. I just got hired back with the Department of Military Affairs there in Lansing as an outside contractor for property book work. So. Okay. Well, your story has a whole other face to it, but we've been at this for the better part of two hours, so I think this is about time to close out this particular session, and we'll schedule the next one because we want to cover the uh, middle years there and then get you into the guard and eventually back over to Iraq. But in the meantime, thanks for coming in and sharing a story with me. You're welcome. All right. Switch off the mics here.